Hi, I'm Jim. Welcome back to my series on the fundamentals of lift. This time we're going to talk about some of the high-level basics of airfoil shape. We'll be looking at the effects of camber. We'll look at the effects of thickness on pressure distributions and lift. I'm going to be simulating this in X-foil because it's very convenient and it we can take the data from X-foil and get plots of the pressure on upper surfaces of an airfoil versus lower surfaces. The difference, of course, being lift, as you recall from the first video in this series. What is X-foil? It's a somewhat dated, but still fundamentally useful program that analyzes just two-dimensional shapes. So this is not a complete air. Because it's two-dimensional, the numbers aren't 100% representative of what you will see on a real airplane in real life, but they're still useful for comparison purposes. So just to refresh, here's a simulation where I took a simple flat plate, just this airfoil right here. It's just a rectangle with an ellipse on the front. I ran it through X-foil at a Reynolds number of 1 million, pretty arbitrarily picked. I arbitrarily picked a static pressure and I arbitrarily picked a airspeed for these plots right here. So at an angle of attack of zero, I get zero lift, no surprise. I get a drag number, and I get the pressure distribution, and because it's at zero degrees angle of attack and it's symmetric, the top and bottom pressures on that airfoil are identical, and I can use that to calculate the velocity. A couple points here I want to just talk about before we get into the meat of this. It's if we zoom in on our airfoil, the tip, you know, there's going to be some streamline coming in that hits exactly on that tip and stops. That's a stagnation point. Air flowing above will curve upwards and over. Air flowing below will curve downwards and then over. In order to decelerate this flow and bring it to a stop right there, the pressure has to go right up. So that's the pressure that we get at that stagnation point. And that matches what you'd get with Bernoulli's equation. The velocity at that stagnation point is zero. Um, just to either side of that here, the air is curving away from the airfoil. That means there's a higher pressure than ambient right there. And we see that in this area. And then as the flow turns inwards towards the airfoil and starts flowing along that curve, that means there's a lower pressure than ambient in that area, which we'd expect from Newton's laws, and that's that lower pressure right there. And then, in accordance with Bernoulli's laws, we have the low speeds here where the pressure is high. We get a high speed flow as that air is zooming around that corner, and the, the pressure gradient going out here is proportional to 1 over the radius. And then since the rest of the airfoil is pretty flat, you know, not much happens as it goes beyond there. What happens when we increase the angle of attack to some positive value, in this case 2.6 degrees? Now X-foil is calculating a coefficient of lift, a coefficient of drag. We can look at the pressure. Again, right at that stagnation point, the pressure is fairly high. As it goes zooming around that corner, it's lower. It's much lower than it was before. We went down just below 29 inches of mercury. Here we're down in the 23 to 24 range. This little kink here is probably the end of that ellipse. And after the air has gone zooming around that corner, it gradually decelerates and just flows along the top surface. Air underneath, the acceleration from that st static point there is, is a little slower, and it, but it, nothing real exciting. Difference in here is lift. I mentioned that the air goes screaming around that corner. Let me draw that. So we've got some angle of attack here, and this is exaggerated. That's our stagnation point. So the air has to turn, and then it's going around this big corner here. The speed there is, it's not quite double the ambient speed, but it's pretty fast, and it's a pretty sharp speed gradient. And that's why flat plates are lousy airfoils, because even at just 2.6 degrees, it's really pushing the ability of the air to stay attached and not stall. So what happens when we put camber in it, right? This is our flat plate with 0%. And I should be clear what camber is. Camber is, if we were to take this distance here from the straight line of the cord to the highest point in that curve, that distance is 8% in this case of the total cord length. Okay, 
So here the distance is 0%, 2% of the chord, 4% of the chord, and 8% of the chord. So we will look at these four airfoils and compare them at a constant angle of attack first. Uh, but before we do that, you want to make a guess which one's going to give the most lift. Okay. Shouldn't be a surprise, right? At the same angle of attack, my flat plate, 2873, and by the time I get to my 8% camber, that's 1.2. That's a factor of about 4. The drag, not much different. Not much different at all, okay? Clear winner, right? That's, that's the airfoil we want if we're just bending a flat plate. And looking at the pressure distribution, again, this sharp low pressure at the very leading edge of the upper surface. Upper surface is plant, plotted on the bottom because that's the lower pressure. As we increase camber, that sharp behavior starts to go away and this airfoil gets much better behaved and now we've just got more lift and it's distributed over the entire airfoil. And because we don't have that bad behavior here right in the very leading edge, we can go to a lot higher angle of attack with this airfoil than we could have with this one. But if I'm flying along, cruising at some speed, you know, lift isn't the only thing. I don't need every ounce of lift that that air wing can generate. I just need the right amount of lift. So if I compare all four of these at a constant lift, constant coefficient of lift, okay, we get a little different story. Coefficient of drag, 0097, so about 001, a little bit lower, same, and oh my gosh, what happened here? You know, that's four to five times as much drag to generate the same lift. So yeah, maybe this wasn't the winner after all. A lot of camber is good if you need a lot of lift at low speeds to get yourself out of a short field or something, but it just absolutely clobbers you if you're at cruise speeds. It's like having a speed break because we have to go to a negative angle of attack to not create too much lift in this particular scenario. And if you look at the pressure here, the upper surface actually has a high pressure at the beginning so the airflow is coming in like this, and we have a, that high pressure on top of the wing, and then for the air, because the air is curving away, and underneath the wing, because the air is trying to curve inward here, we have a low pressure, so we actually generate some negative lift right there at the very leading edge, and we generate lots of drag, which brings us up to about the beginning of World War I, so if we look at aircraft up to that point, uh, 1909 Bellario, about a 5% camber on that wing. I didn't try to measure the camber on this layered biplane from 1915, but you can see it's that just a thin cambered wing just like this. Sopwith Camel, again, not as much camber. Uh, they were, you know, trying to, it's a fighter plane, it's got to go fast, but it's still pretty thin, and that's was the trend at that time to stick with thin, fairly sharp nosed airfoils because, well, previous aircraft that used wing warping like that, uh, you know, you needed thin, flexible airfoils to do wing warping. But even beyond that, you know, it just makes sense that a thinner section is going to have less drag than something thicker, right? make it thicker, it's going to push more air out of the way, there's going to be more drag. The, the downside to the thin wings, of course, is that you need lots of structural bracing outside the wing. There's not much room for spars. You know, this is the spar right here, and there's a rear spar back here. And they're not very tall, okay? And the ability for a sp structure like that to carry load and bending is a function of that height cubed, so we don't have much height there, so we go to a lot of wire bracing, and you can see the wires going here, there, and everywhere on this biplane. We've got struts here, we've got a post sticking down and wires going everywhere. There's a, here a wire, there a wire, everywhere a wire, wire. And that was state of the art up until about 1918 when Prandtl at the University of Göttingen
and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, came out with the Gottingen 298 airfoil, which had a camber similar, similar to the Sopwith Camel, but instead of being 5% thick, was 13% thick. This is a big, fat deviation from state-of-the-art, but what that enabled them to do is build an airplane without all the wires. If you look, there's just, just these struts to connect the wings and no cross-bracing wires, and the prototype of the triplane didn't even have those struts. It was strictly a cantilevered wing. And as it turns out, even though the drag of this thicker airfoil is a little bit larger, getting rid of all that wires resulted in a net reduction in drag, and the Fokker triplane had the lowest drag of any aircraft of its vintage. So let's look at the effects of camber on pressure and lift. Over here on the right we have our flat plate again. You saw this before. On the left I have a 12% thick wing. In this case I used one of the old NACA four-digit profiles uh, moving us up into the 1930s. And some of these are still in use today. So if we look at the pressure, you know, instead of this sharp turn here where we have this locally high velocity and all that happening at one point, we round things out quite a bit and there's stuff going on over the whole length of that airfoil. So it's a smoother, softer, better behaved flow turning at that leading edge and along the whole surface. Of course at zero angle of attack with no camber it's still zero lift. So let's throw some camber in here and see what happens. So here's four airfoils again. The 2% camber we looked at before, the NACA 2406, so that is 6% thick, and the camber here, by 6% thick, I mean that the total thickness is 6% of the total cord. The camber here is 2%, just like the flat plate above. Uh, this is a relatively flat bottom airfoil as opposed to this under cambered one here. Next airfoil, NACA 2412. This is still in use on aircraft like the Cessna 150, 172. Uh, a lot of the strut braised Cessnas use this airfoil. When you look at it on the airplane, it looks kind of flattish bottomed. I know because you kind of look at the area of the strut is somewhere around here. You know, you know, this part of it looks fairly flat, and you know, it's easy to think of this as having that cartoon flat bottom shape, but if you want to argue that the bottom is flat, I'll argue that the top is flat as well, because it's, you know, if you just look at the back section, this is pretty close to flat as well. So I'm, this is not a flat bottomed airfoil, even though a quick glance on the ramp might make you see, think that. You know, there's, there's a fair amount of curve under here. And then we get to the NACA 2418, 18% thick, same 2% camber. So the camber is identical in all these. Uh, round on the top, round on the bottom. So before I go to the next slide, stop and think, you know, which of these airfoils is going to have the most lift at a fixed angle of attack? We'll go to that same 2.6 degrees that we used before. The under cambered thin airfoil, the flat bottom airfoil, the curved bottom airfoil, or the fat boy airfoil. Pause the video and make a prediction if you want in the comments. And let's move on. So there's the results from X-foil, 2.6 degree angle of attack, 0.519 coefficient of lift, 0 0.518, 0 0.533, 0 0.5135. They're all within 4%. The lift is virtually identical for all four of those airfoils at the same angle of attack. Were you expecting that? I suspect not. And if we look at the pressure distributions again, that sharp corner, as we get thicker and thicker, this gets more and more rounded and better behaved. If we look at the really thick one, you know, look how nice and smooth that is. But at the same time, as we're rounding that off, we're moving our entire pressure distributions downwards into the lower pressures because the air is flowing around both sides of that thickness. And at this point, the lower surface actually has a low pressure relative to ambient. So that's one of the reasons that the drag is up a bit here. Let's take one more look at these airfoils. I've got two plots. Angle of attack on the bottom axis. This is a coefficient of lift. 
this is the coefficient of drag. And through here, you know, from a lift perspective, they're all pretty much the same. The thicker airfoils let us go to higher angles of attack, higher coefficients of lift. And if you look at these two, between the 12% and the 18%, the 18% has a, a smoother, softer stall up there near the top. You know, these two we don't see a stall behavior because X-foil just falls apart and can't model that without a lot more work on my part. Uh, drag, low coefficients or low angles of attack, not much different. But as you start to approach those limits, uh, the thin airfoils again fall apart. Probably get some flow separation near the front early on. So that's kind of some of the basics. Now why do you find some of these different airfoils and different aircraft? This is the NACA 2412 again, like on a Cessna 150, 172, the strut brace Cessnas, 12% thick. And you tend to find that kind of airfoil on strut braced aircraft. You know, it's got some room for a spar, but by keeping it thinner, you keep the drag down a little bit but then you have to add the strut to support the wing. Down below here, the NACA 65 to 415, that's used on the Piper Cherokee, which is a cantilevered wing. There's no struts at all, so they can choose a thicker airfoil to give them a taller wing spar in there because the strength of that spar and bending is, again, a, fu a function of the height cubed, so increasing that thickness lets you get a lot more strength for a given weight and for a moderate increase of drag to offset the drag of the strut, you tend to find thicker wing profiles like this on cantilevered wings. With some exceptions, you find the thinner profiles on strut braced wings. An exception might be something like a Piper Cub where they've gone to more camber to because the pub because the cub was originally pretty underpowered, you know, the original versions, not the Super Cubs, but with that camber, they're really good at short takeoff and landing, and you hit a brick wall, no matter how much horsepower you put in a Cub, you're not going to make a speed demon out of it. This airfoil here is also what they call a laminar flow airfoil. You probably don't get the benefits on the Cherokee with plain aluminum construction, but this airfoil has advantages structurally. Uh, what a laminar flow airfoil does is it by pushing the maximum thickness further aft the point where you start flowing from the fastest airflow and the airflow has to slow down or if you look at it in the pressure you know this is the lowest pressure point and as you move back the pressure is increasing so that air has to flow against the pressure gradient by moving that back, you can keep a smooth laminar boundary layer, less drag along the surface uh, for a longer period, and so there's less. the idea is to have less drag under certain conditions. And this is a plot of, this is the lift coefficient, drag coefficient, comparing a 2312 and the 631.412. The dotted line here is the laminar airfoil and you can see this little bucket here okay uh, so on a smooth wind tunnel model you get this area here where the drag is significantly reduced compared to the conventional airfoil now the downside is if it's a rough surface um, yeah not much difference <laughs> you know you, you lose all that laminar voodoo fun stuff trivia thing Usually people credit the P-51 as the first production laminar flow airfoil. Actually, it was the Davis wing on the B-24 that went into production a little before the P-51. Last airfoil I'm going to talk about up here, uh, real quick, this is a one of the early designs intended for transonic things like airliners. You know, this, this high speed flow over that top is going faster than the flow in general. And as a result, with a conventional airfoil, you get into sonic air speeds on top of the airfoil before the aircraft gets to sonic or supersonic speeds, the speed of sound. And that creates a shock wave and the drag goes up 
horrendously. So for aircraft that try to cruise close to the speed of the sound to get across oceans quickly, uh, Whitcomb came up with this airfoil that's pretty flat on the top, so you don't get that, that low pressure, high velocity area. Put in a bit of an under camber at the back to get that airflow directed downward and still get the lift. And that's the style that's used on airliners that fly in the transonic region. Pretty much looks nothing like the cartoon airfoils that you see where people talk about venturis and curve tops and distances and you know those theories don't explain how you get to Disney World every day. Well you know but not many people going to Disney World today it's closed but you get the point I think. A lot of those so-called theories are plain nonsense. With that I think I babbled long enough. Thanks for tuning in. I'm not sure where I'm going to go with this series, if I continue it or not. But if I do, I'll catch you on the flip side.